So that's a lesson from Samson and Delilah. Do you live on God's power and stay within God's constraints and rules? Or do you uh, go fit in with the crowd who's jealous of the power you're actually, you actually have? Again, what did Christ do for 30 years? He didn't do good deeds. He studied scripture. And by the time, now this is really important, when you're a baby, you can't walk, you can't talk, you can't think, you can't do nothing but poop. And even that's happening just because it happens. It's not even true poop for a long time. It's called macomium. It's a sort of watery, yucky thing. It's really hard to clean up after a baby. Okay, so all you can do is poop once you're saved. But because all you can do is poop, there's a lot of Christian poop that's masquerading as spiritual work that's pooped on you and you're going to think that you ought to poop like everybody else around you is pooping. And you don't know it's poop. So now you're divorcing the word that you haven't even learned yet in favor of your poop, in favor of what you can do with your body. So you're not going to be competent in what you do. You're going to be selling Satan's plan to them just like the woman sold it to Adam who was standing right there when she ate the fruit to start with. Not good, huh? Because until you can associate the word enough, you don't know how to use your body. And if you don't have the word in you, no matter how you use your body, it's poop. What did Jesus do? Nothing. What work did Jesus do? do? Nothing. What word did Jesus learn? All of it. How long did it take? At least 30 years before God put him to the test. God put the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Did you read Matthew 4? The Holy Spirit did it to him. The Holy Spirit said, go in the wilderness go without food for 40 days God gave him something to do God gave him a command when you're a baby you don't even you can't even understand words so you can't obey you can't do anything but to hear the apostate Christians tell you two seconds after you're saved you gotta hustle for God with what? How much Bible's in your head? None. After a year of being a Christian, how much Bible's in your head? Very, very, almost none. After five years, you can maybe mouth the words. I'm, I'm dead serious. The analogy to physical ch- childhood is very, very complete, and and First John uses this. A five-year-old child can articulate a little bit can understand a very little bit and really all he is is a parrot he really doesn't understand what he says oh mommy says this is good oh mommy says that is bad assuming that a five year old child can even articulate that well a smart five year old child can articulate that well I mean even Mozart who could play you know the harpsichord really well at that at, at five or nine I forget but he's still parroting what he saw he just was really good at remembering how the the keys moved and repeating it he didn't really understand what he was doing it's really important to, to, to get this 
Children are parrots. They're imitators. That's how they learn. But just because you can reproduce the sounds or the words or the ideas in your mouth doesn't mean you actually understand them. So a five-year-old born-again Christian, when I say five-year-old, I mean he could be 50 going on five, 25 going on five, 15 going on five. He's been a believer for five years. He's probably gotten five years worth of Sundays hearing the gospel every Sunday. He really has no clue about what the hypostatic union is. Well, Jesus is God, man. Yeah, but he doesn't know what that means. God is love. Well, he doesn't know what love means. He doesn't even know what God means. He can repeat it. That's not somebody who's capable of doing a good deed. He doesn't have enough Bible functioning in his head to be competent at it. Again, Christ was perfect his whole life. And God doesn't send him out until he's 30? So what are we doing? Doing deeds when we're not as mature as Christ was at 30. I mean, he could articulate Bible better than the sages when he was 12. We got that story in Luke. Okay, but you don't see any good deeds recorded of Christ. And you certainly don't see any recorded before he's 30. So why are we doing it? So what's the key? He tells us, associating the Bible with your body. That's a daily practice. And of course he's training to become king. He's training to become savior. Not a peasant. A peasant needs less training than a king. But you're in training to become a king under the king of kings. So what do you do? The same thing I just talked about before. What I learned in Bible class about Samson and Delilah and how do I apply it to what I got to do here. Because everything you got in the body is practice using the Bible you learned. That's what it is. And you're going to screw it up. I, I, let's see, I'm 59. I've been a believer According to my mother, I've been a believer since I was four or six. So that's what, 50, over 50 years I've been saved. Okay. So I've been practicing what I learned on my body for 50 some years. How good am I at it? Not very. If anything good gets done with anything I do, God made it happen. I still can't. So, anything good that got done was based on whatever Bible was in my head when I did it. How long did it take me to actually learn that? Minimum of 20 years before it all came together. Did God use whatever I learned? Every single minute I was breathing? Yeah, I'm sure he did. But I have no clue what it was. So Christ had to wait 30 years. And I can't even tell you what good got done with whatever I've done in my body from the Bible that I know. All I know is that I really know it now. That's all I can tell you as a result. Then... What must the spiritual life actually be? The quality of what you do in your body is based on the quality of what's in your soul. If the quality of what's in your soul is satanic thinking, then that's the quality of what you're doing. If the quality of what's in your soul is a sin nature thinking, then that's the quality of what you're doing. If the quality of what's in your soul is Bible running in your head because you're between sins using one John 1 9 and learning and living on Bible under your pastor, then that's divine quality. 
even if you're doing the dishes. Now, the ultimate statement about this is that God hears everything you think. I've harped many times on bringing every thought into captivity. That's association. You're associating something you learned in Bible with something you're doing with your body. You get into the habit, like piano practice, so it becomes fluent, so it becomes easy. And as I said before, your mind is constantly on everything. you got 16,000 inputs. You're making 16,000 decisions every minute. And with the Bible coming into your life, you're making constant decisions about associating the Bible with what you're doing. At least asking the question at first. And if you keep asking the question, that's a habit. Then you start gradually to be able to cycle the answers like the story of Samson and Delilah. And so then what's going to happen to you, probably after you got that story with Samson and Delilah, is some apostate Christian will come up and want you to go out soul winning with them. And you're going to say no. Because of the Bible in your head. Because that's the same analogy as what Delilah was doing to Samson. And you're not going to buy it. Because you want God's power in you. And you know that sitting there and studying that Bible is going to really win souls. Rather than what that person's going to do who doesn't know the Bible like you're learning it. Because God's buying time for the world because you're sitting there learning Bible. That's Hebrews 11. And maybe at this point, you can't articulate it the way I did. But you'll have some idea. Hi, studying Bible is really pretty much more important. And you might only be able to articulate back to the soul winner. Look, Christ says you learn and live on Bible. Not on activity. So, excuse me, but I'm going to go learn and live on Bible, Matthew 4 4. So you do. And you're doing the good deed, and the soul winner out there is doing Satan's deeds instead. So you're buying time for that person doing Satan's deeds to wake up and smell the coffee because eventually the person doing Satan's deeds finds out just how he doesn't get paid. You're learning and living on Bible. You're doing what Christ did in Hebrews 10.5. You're doing Matthew 4.4. 4. And you're doing it poorly. Are you doing it like, God, how do I relate this story? I still don't know. Yeah, but you asked the question. So that's one dendrite of connection to the vertical that's going into your horizontal life. And you keep repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating the question and each time you repeat the question you get a little more of the answer so those dendrites building vertically toward God the thought pattern associative thought pattern thought patterns run on brain cells brain cells are hooked up like dendrites you have dendrites and axons in the brain and that's building the pathway the firing of the electrodes or they're not actually electrodes, electrical impulses in your brain are going in that direction, beating down a path, laying down a path like grass, so that the next time you got to do something, it will be easier to think of the question, okay, God, how does this relate? And the next time, and the next time, and the next time, just like exercise. Repeat, 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 repeat the question, whether you know the answer or not. Now that's pretty dull. It's all internal. Nobody can see you doing great things for God. But you are. Because you're learning to bring every thought into captivity. Here is this proposal. You got 60 seconds. Do you listen to an audio that happens to be about God? Or do you do something else? That's an important decision. Your time is valuable. Well, what does God think? See? The association. What does God think? It becomes a habit. It becomes instinctive. A question in your mind to make a decision. 
It becomes instinctive. So now you got this traffic cop. Here's this proposal. How do I spend the next minute? Well, what does God think? Is the is the like almost automatic reply? What does God say? And then there's a sort of like, Bleh. well, I don't know what God says. And you might still not know. But the question became a deeper habit because it got asked. And then, eventually, and this will start happening more and more often, you'll start to get immediate answers. My, my pastor calls this doctrinal instincts. And you start to get answers. And sometimes you don't even know. The Holy Spirit will just give you the answer. And you don't know that you actually got it from Him. But it will, something about it will seem right. I mean, that's how I'm able to talk to you right now. It just seems right what's coming out of my mouth. I'm not actually going through the process of, Okay, what do I say next, Dad? I'm not asking the question. Because He's been trained. I've done it so often. That I, I just, I can tell as it's coming out. Yes, this is right. Yes, this is right. And that will happen to you too in your daily life. Then you're really living the spiritual life. Because you're associating the vertical with the horizontal. And only then is whatever you do a God deed. Which is better. Even one God deed. For one minute. Is worth more than all the good deeds on the planet from the time Adam fell until the end of time. Because no human being can do a God deed. But a God deed is occurring in a human being, namely you. Because you asked. And you couldn't have asked if you didn't know enough doctrine to ask. Because billions of Christians out there don't know enough doctrine to ask. They do it on their own power instead of God's. That's why they don't know the Bible. That's why they believe false doctrine. They can't read the Bible. Because they're not using God's power to read it. They're not using 1 John 1 9. So they have no clue what the Bible says. Even when they can parrot the words. Even when as it were by mistake. They get some of it right. They're parroting. They're children. They're five years old. They can parrot the words. But it doesn't mean they understand them. 2,000 years we've known Matthew 4.4. 4. So how come we're not living it? Why does paying the poor get all the attention and the money spent and Matthew 4.4 4 gets how much attention? Zero. Or it gets chirping, parroted attention. Everywhere I'm going to live on the Word of God. And then you go right back to doing your deeds not living on the Word of God and you don't even know that's what you just did. So there's your solution. What do you do the minute you're saved, honey, all you can do is poop. Ask God who's your teacher. Name your sins when you think of them. And he'll do the rest. And he'll even cause you to remember that you need to use 1 John 1 9. And when you screw up, which you will every single minute, he'll correct you. Either through nice circumstances or not one. Not nice one. Everything's being used to teach. Everything's being used to develop the vertical. Because the vertical is what? I. So you can see God. So the I, meaning me, can see the you who is God. And then what's the horizontal? What's the joining of an I with a horizontal dash below it? L. For love. For Lord. For learn. Learn and live on Bible is the spiritual life. And you ask questions every minute you breathe. Okay, Dad, how should I sit? I mean, you don't have to get that anal about it, but it would be kind of fun to know. 
How do I sit now? Do I pare my nails? Should I eat vegetables? What do I write in this email? I mean, it can become an instantaneous question, habit, answer. So that you, you're not really spending time asking the question. You just sort of think it that like a nanosecond. And it gets into the L. Okay, the bi-directional. Coming down from God to your horizontal life. Going up to God from your horizontal life. And it gets to be a ballet dance of a pas de deux. Where you're both in step. Now, in actuality, that will occur at moments. And you almost always know afterwards. It will occur in moments. It might occur for, ooh, as long as five minutes at, a, at one time. But then it's really a God deed happening in your soul from God to you and back out from you to God. And your body is coming along for the ride. And now you're a spoon being used by God. And you don't even know what good it's doing. He does. And the biggest good that it's doing is forever and ever and ever and ever. Every single moment that that bidirectional communication is going on. You're between sins. You've used 1 John 1 9. You're learning and living on Bible, however, clumsily. But it's a moment that it's happening. That moment is just like the cross. God lives forever. That moment is alive to God forever. His pleasure in that moment has always been and always will be. So now a moment is no longer a moment. It's forever. Because every moment is forever alive to omniscience. So God's pleasure in that moment you and him had together is forever alive to him. To him. Whether it did any good for anybody else or not. And what do you care if it did any good for anybody else or not? If it's doing for him. What's the first commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Okay, that moment you did. That moment is replicated many times on different topics, in different ways, on the most mundane subjects, washing dishes, peeing, email, where do I buy tomatoes at the store? Okay, but those are moments with God. And those moments actually do last forever. Because omniscience, that moment never dies to omniscience. Between God and you. There ain't no good deed as good as that. That's the cross. That's how the cross works. That's what Christ said when he was born. Hebrews 10.5 That's what he said in Matthew 4.4 4. And the the thing that tipped me off to this years ago was when I was pacing the, the living room trying to figure all this stuff out. And he hit me with Matthew 4.4 4, always occurring. Those were his exact words to me while I was pacing the living room floor. And my life hasn't been the same since then. So maybe yours won't either. The moment I have with him where it's pas de Dieu, I'm between sins. He's sending thoughts to me, I'm sending thoughts back. I'm learning and living on Bible, however rudely, however clumsily, however stupidly, however smartly. But that moment I'm saying, you know, it's precious to him. This is what really gets to me. It's precious to him that I wanted to know. Okay, Dad, what do I do with this email? 
I might not even get an answer. I wanted to know. I'm not doing a good deed. I want to know. I want to get something from him. It's his good deed, if any deed at all. And that's precious to him. Matthew 4.4, 4, always occurring. I'm asking the question of what words proceed from the mouth of God. Okay, I have all this Bible. It's like a library in my head. Which book do I select? What verse applies? I have no clue. That's precious to him. It will always be precious to him. Hence his answer. When I was asking the same question, what was it, 11, 15, 11 years ago? I'm not sure. The year 2000? Something like that. Matthew 4, 4, always occurring. That's his answer. That's his answer to you. That's the pleasure of God in our learning and living on Bible Hebrews 11, 6. There's no good deed that, that can be done. It's that good. Okay? So that's how you live the spiritual life. Ask God, okay, how do I use Bible today? What should I be thinking, Dad? I don't understand the Trinity. Whatever you want to ask. And keep trying to figure out, okay, how does Bible apply to pee? Taking a shower. What brand of deodorant do I use? As long as you're asking the question, you're building the dendrites of the habit of looking to God like Christ looked at God that minute he was born Hebrews 10 5 he associated his body with God so can you and that is Matthew 4 4 always occurring that is spiritual life and you just wait baby and see what God does with it 